with um, my next guest, the Home Office uh, Minister, Damien. Hi, it's Damien. Very good to see you. Um, so, Jim Ratcliffe, who probably knows more about the gas market than you know, pretty much anybody else, uh, uh, says there is a real risk of the UK running out of gas this winter. Um, we don't have enough secure supplies. So what's plan B? So my, my understanding is we are expecting to be able to secure the volumes of gas that are required uh, over the winter. And, you know, pol politicians aren't making these projections themselves. Of course, they're listening to industry experts, including uh, probably... Uh, colleagues of, of, of Sir Jim, uh, but also scientists, industrial advisers and so on. And that's, and that's how we come to, these, uh, come to these determinations. I mean, did you sort of slightly shudder when he said, you know, when it comes to talking to people in government, um, he sees more people thinking about the long-term future of manufacturing outside the UK than in the UK government? So I, I don't recognise that characterisation. He mentioned financial services. Yeah, we have got... Uh, uh, a successful and important financial services sector. We've also got a very uh, successful pharmaceutical sector, for example. We do very well in automotive and other areas of advanced manufacturing. There's a, there's a you know a diversity of sectors which underpin the underpin the UK economy, and a, and a number of them we are genuinely genuinely world beating. I mean, just for what it's worth, I mean, he's not the only uh, business leader I've talked to about this issue of inadequate storage. And, in fact, I was very close to the round a number mm. of years ago about the big facility at Rough, which, in the end, as a result of government policy, never got built. I mean, we, he is completely right that they have way more storage, you know, across the channel than we have here, and that does make us more vulnerable. So, I, mean, I think one, one of the most important things is diversity of supply source. And, as I understand it, about half of our production is domestic and the rest comes from uh, different, different sources. Also, you know, in terms of wider energy, it's really important that we're investing in, in nuclear, in renewables. And th th these, these are really important things to make sure that we have energy security you know, firmly, into, firmly into the future and that we are pursuing our decarbonisation goals at the same time. But when... I mean, we're going to go to the break in just a second, but when Kwasi Kwasi mm. says there's literally no chance of us running out and you hear somebody as close to the market as mm. Jim Ratcliffe saying there's every chance, what do you think, who do you think my, my, you know, our viewers are going to believe? Well, as I said a moment ago, you, know, you, you shouldn't think that politicians come up with these projections sitting at their own Excel spreadsheets, you know, drawing the graphs. Of course not. One of the benefits of being in government is that you have the benefit of, you know, all the, 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 the wide range of advice that you could possibly uh, get hold of. And, of course, this is a very, very important issue. And we are at a, you know, we're at a, a critical time. Oh, We've just come out of this pandemic. Yep. Uh, and, of course, there has been some turbulence. And Minister are very, very focused on that. Don't, don't go away, please. There's so much I want to talk to... Uh, so much going on the world I want to talk to you about. But also, I will be talking with the uh, sort of superstar American politician, the Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Don't go away. Welcome back. I'm thrilled that Damien Hines, our Home, Home Office Minister, is still here. First, Anushka. Thank you. Now, as Robert was saying, Boris Johnson faced major critique from two select committees for his COVID response this week. Now, the government will take comfort in the fact that we're in a much better place now than last year. But could there be reason to worry as we enter winter? I want to show you some interesting stuff tweeted by academic Colin Angus from Sheffield University. He starts by making clear that we're not at crisis point. And I just want to show you one chart that he puts up. This is looking at absolute levels of COVID divided by age. So right up here, we actually have 10 to 14 year olds. The next group is 15 to 19, then 0 to 4, which means older, more vulnerable groups are lower down, which is reassuring because we know young people are hit less. But Colin also show, shared some other things that I'm about to show you. Hopefully this is the right thing. So this is a very, very messy graph, again, broken down by age, but this time not looking at absolute levels of COVID, but whether COVID is rising, in which case lines are going up or falling in different age groups overall all over the place. But I'm going to try and untangle it for you by showing you just 60 to 79 year olds as he did. And you can see their line here. And this is worrying because all of them are rising pretty sharply right now. Now, 
Obviously, most of those people will have had two vaccinations, but given concerns about immunity waning, they really need boosters. And on that, some slightly less good news, which I'm going to show you here from John Roberts from the COVID-19 Actuary Response Group. That tracks risk. He pointed out that on Monday, for example, only 92,000 boosters were administered. Overall, only 2.7 million out of a total 6.8 8 million who are eligible have had them so far, which means that something has gone wrong in the government's messaging. Robert. Thanks so much, Anushka. Um, I might pick up on COVID in a minute, uh, Damien, but I just want to actually talk about the story of the day, which is this off offer that the EU yeah. has made on the Northern Ireland protocol. Does that feel like a basis for a negotiation that could lead to an acceptable compromise? Well, look, it's only just come out and, it, it, you know, the detail in these things is, is really important. Our command paper, of course, mm -hmm. was back in July. And the sure command paper the, is a world team, away from what they've offered. The team will be studying in detail what's come from the European Union. I think, as Arlene said earlier, I mean, there's certainly there's, there, there's stuff in it, right? I mean, and that's, and that's welcome, particularly on the volume of checks. But it doesn't address the ECJ, the European yeah, Court, problem, which is, which and, is really, and really is key. It really, but, is it really... This, this issue... I mean, you know, Northern Ireland is in the single market, effectively, yeah. as a result of the deal that you agreed yeah. to keep the border open. It's also in the UK. And, 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 and the, so first, it, first and foremost, uh, and, that's, and that's the key point, all, all of these things have to work, right? So the, the north-south um, you know, trading arrangements have to work, but so do the east-west trading mm -hmm. arrangements. And critically, anything in Northern Ireland, for it to work and for it to, uh, and for it to, to last and, and endure, has to have the support of both communities. It has to work for everybody sure. uh, in Northern Ireland. And the history of Northern Ireland, Arlene knows this better than, better than most, the history of Northern Ireland is a history of, of, of striving, going that extra mile sure. to find the thing, to find the, the, you know, the, the, the accommodation that is going to work for everybody because what, what they've, what's been achieved in Northern Ireland has to be protected. It has to be no, for. I mean, everybody would agree that the peace and the conditions for peace have to be protected. Lord Frost says there should be no role for the European Court of Justice. So that is a red line from which the British government will simply not waver. I just want to be clear about that. Yeah, Lord, I mean, you heard from Lord Frost um, today, and he's been really clear that the democratic legitimacy of what happens is, is incredibly important. But, look, this document's only come out, you know, just it now. does sound to Just me now, as though Union. we are and heading for Article 16 being triggered at a trade well, war. That's we, what it sounds well, like. We don't want that to happen. We are negotiating uh, in good faith and openly. We don't want to have to trigger, uh, trigger Article 16, mm. but it is there. It's mm. there as a... I was about to say as a backstop. It's there. It's there. It's in, you know, it's, it's in the bag. But, but we hope not to have to use it. And, you know, there, there, is a, there is an arrangement to be made, a deal to be done, and I think it's in everybody's interest. It's in the you know, UK's interest, it's in the EU's interest, it's in the Republic of Ireland's and, interest, and it's and, certainly, you know, in the, and, the, and, into the people of Northern Ireland to make sure we get a good deal. And just one... We're almost out of time, but, but just one question on, on COVID. Mm. All of, you know, you were in a government with uh, Jeremy Hunt and yep. with Greg Clark, yep. uh, and, you know, they authored... Uh, report yesterday that was very damning of the, you know, government's performance when it came to protecting us for months and months and months, and yet no member of the government is prepared to say sorry. Well, I mean, I think if you, you know, go back to what the Prime Minister himself uh, has said, uh, he is sorry for every single not saying person that, who it, died. But he's, but he's, not, but he's not conceding he suffered, made mistakes, and, takes, he? and he also said you know, clearly that... You know, government ministers and prime minister right at the top take responsibility for what government does, but that at all times what they were absolutely striving to do was to minimise the number of deaths, to minimise the amount of suffering. And I don't think any in a crisis situation, uh, and the scale of the crisis situation we've we've been going through is is genuinely unprecedented. I don't think in that kind of situation anybody can ever look back and say mm -hmm. nothing was done that could have been done that you know, couldn't have been done better. Mm -hmm. Of course that is the case, but I do know that everybody was striving to try and do the right thing. And then, of course, the vaccination programme uh, came forward. That's been, that's been a great success and puts us now in, in, a, in a good position compared to many other countries. Damien, so lovely to see you. Thanks so much for coming 